trying to climb the stairs without falling over my rather long frock. <laughs> Thank you for coming along tonight and hopefully to sort of listen to me stirring things along in my usual fashion. I was just saying when I was talking to them downstairs about having been appointed for Austra the Australia Post uh, Legends in 2011 that I bowled up to the head of Australia Post when we had the presentation dinner in Melbourne and said to him, you're lucky I haven't turned up with a T-shirt saying don't close Glebe Post Office because there was a demonstration on the same day that I was down there, that I was down there getting the Legends Award. He looked somewhat startled and we had an odd conversation about why shouldn't we close it. I said, because it's actually the only place in Glebe, if any of you know Glebe, Sydney, where public housing and other tenants and other people in the Glebe estate, uh, the Glebe area meet. He said, oh, we could turn it into a community service. And I said, I thought it was a community service. He said, oh, no, 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 we're a, you know, we're a commercial organisation. So that gives you some idea of where my politics come from. <laughs> I spend quite a lot of time stirring things along. And I mean, in a way, that's what I'm going to be doing to some degree today because I think it's in my DNA. And also because when I was rung up and asked to talk, I thought, why am I being asked to talk at the art gallery? This isn't my, my usual area of operations. And they said, oh, no, no, we want you to talk about sort of lifestyle and various other things. So I thought, all right, I'll sort of talk about things that I do feel comfortable with. And it's not about the art of, uh, you know, of, 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 the, of the artist, about Bacon's art, because I really am not somebody who can make comments about aesthetics and various other things there. It's way outside my area of comfort. But what I want to talk about is really the sort of social milieu, which is what they asked me to talk about, in which he found his inspiration, but in a much broader sense, to talk about Francis Bacon as a sort of artistic phenomenon, as an archetype, as something which whenever you read about Bacon, you read about his sex life, you read about his relationships, you read about the fact that he got drunk, you read about the various other things like that. There's, there's a setting up of this sort of archetypal view of the artistic genius. And here we start moving into some of the things where my sort of feminist stuff comes out because there's very much this idea that there is this idea, you know, that genius is basically male. It's quite hard if you think about it to think of women who get labelled as geniuses. And it's male because we just there's an assumption built quite deeply into Western society, I mean into other societies as well, but diff somewhat differently about the predominance and the sort of thing about, you know, the, of masculinity as part of that sort of province of this. And what this reminded me of, of was a book I read when I was in my late teens. And it was a book some people here look as though they might be old enough to remember by a man called Joyce Carey. I remember it quite distinctly because I was quite curious to find a man called Joyce. And it was part of a trilogy that he read, uh, that he'd written. The first one was Herself Surprised, but it was actually the last of the trilogy, and it was called The Horse's Mouth. I don't know whether any, how many people here have actually remember reading that. Yes, quite a few there. And when I was thinking about this quite early in the piece, the image of the horse's mouth came in, the image of Gully Jimston, who was this really archetypal, drunken, rollicking, sexually de uh, active painter. And I can remember at the time it sort of sticking in my mind because it really built up the idea that the artist was this person that got nurtured by others, that got supported by others, that behaved atrociously, ab not abominably, whose creativity needed to be nursed and fed by others. So therefore it was a very machismo, sort of masculine version of what was a genius. And even then, in my late teens or whatever it was I was reading, I can remember it sort of sticking in my mind in a sort of vague question as to, is that what artistic genius is about? Is it about that particular model which assumes that there is this absolute fun, fund of creativity but has to somehow either come together with a penis and various other pieces of anatomy that appear to feed into it? And therefore, it made it very difficult for any woman to even conceptualise themselves in that same category as the great artist. And when you think about it, even now, I mean, this was long before I'd got involved in sort of feminist issues. It obviously niggled at me enough to make me remember it. 
And it niggled to, uh, for me because when I got asked about this, I sort of started casting back in my own memory of who I was because I had been part in Sydney and then later I became part in London of the sort of marginal bohemias that, we, that, that existed in the 1950s, late 1950s, early 1960s. I was one of the members of a group called the Sydney Push that some of you might have heard about, which actually had the distinction of also making turning Jermaine Greer into a feminist as well. So you can imagine that some of the gender relationships within the Push were distinctly odd. But they were very much into the idea about, this, about sexuality and the pleasures of sexuality being very much built up on this masculinized model, which meant the women were allowed to have sexual relationships, but they were supposed to enjoy them pretty much the way blokes did, and that was it. And after all they were supposed to do is, I can remember having an argument with somebody who said, you'll never get rid of your bourgeois inhibitions until you have sex with me. And the, you know, that is true freedom. And I said, no, freedom is the idea of not having sex with you because I don't want to. I don't think I ever got forgiven for that particular one. I was regarded as a very impure libertarian at that particular point in time. So obviously at that stage I was sufficiently diplomatic, undiplomatic to not fit even within the bohemian thing. But I was aware of it and I was hanging around at that stage with the person who was in my particular relationship at that time who was a young poet who used to get himself drunk and sort of disgracefully sort of out of it and I used to have to go along and haul him out from whichever pub he was in, sober him down, try and shove him into doing whatever particular task he was supposed to be doing. And seeing that very much as the role a bit like Gully Jimson's women and that's obviously why that particular thing stuck to me. And it stuck into that mind, into my mind went the stereotype of, you know, the male creative genius and the female supporter. Now, I know Jimson was actually heterosexual and Bacon is not. But when you look at Bacon, he actually has in his life some very strong women who are very much part of, of that support system, from the woman who was his nanny to the woman who ran the gallery who got him all organised. So he fits very much within that sort of stereotype of the male genius, the artist, the person who needed to be nurtured, cared for and, and, and made sort of able to produce his genius, unfettered by anything domestic, anything that would undermine the time that he spent in being the artist, in being the, the upfront thing. And I had this sort of fantasy that, you know, had this person been Frances Bacon with an E, and had she had to go back home to sort of feed the kids, bath them, do the washing and do the various other things, do you think we would have had the same sort of paintings, however good a painter she was, as they have here in the, gal in the exhibition downstairs? And you realise that there is this view of the artist as being much, more, much bigger than normal, and the bigness is actually not having to sort of conform with the various things of normality. Now, the reason that this interested me as a phenomenon, and I, as I said, I went, I went from the Sydney Push to live in Soho for a while in 19, what was it, 1959, 1960. And I actually, the bloke that I found in a Soho bar and eventually followed me back here and I married foolishly, but that's another story was very much part of that particular environment that Bacon was part of. I don't know whether they overlapped, but he was actually living with a, a very good photographer called Ida Carr, who is quite well known, who spent a lot of time photographing artists. So when I met John, he was actually in the process of photographing artists, and I was racking my brains to see whether or not he'd ever photographed a woman artist, even though she was a uh, his partner who was older than him was a woman who was a photographer. She was single. She had no children. She had a slightly younger boyfriend. She was very much on that sort of model of, of the artistic being on a fairly masculinized model. And I couldn't think in the time that I was with him, mind you, he didn't spend all that much time with either after we started a relationship as one didn't. But, you know, it was that sort of thing about artists were men. I remember because he was trying to make money at some stages of photography, he started shooting women as sex objects. Not particularly objectionably, but I mean, you know, that was the idea. You shot women because women looked sexy and you shot men because they were important. 
And so this was the same sort of period in the late 1950s where so much of what happened with Bacon was happening, you know, around him. And it was, it was a post, it was post-war, it was that funny sort of period which doesn't get written up very often uh, between the sort of first relief about the end of the Second World War, that sort of sense of, you know, the war is over and we can get back to normality, whatever normality was. And people weren't too sure what normality was because you'd had six years of war and before that you'd had a depression. And so, I mean, it was a long time, you know, almost back to the 1920s before you had any idea of what, you know, normality, and that was after the First World War. So it really was unclear. So you had this frantic push for conformity, suburbanism, ordinariness, getting back to what was real. And underpinning that in London, in Paris, in the USA, I mean, in, in London you had the whole stuff in Soho, in Paris you had Jean-Paul Sartre and the whole thing, Juliette Greco, the whole artistic things, the whole West, uh, left bank type stuff. In the USA, I can remember the excitement about the beat generation coming up and, you know, the things about the poets and things like that. In Australia, as I say, we had the Sydney push and its various manifestations, including some painters and things that were part of that, though they were part, more part of the Melbourne push. So you had this uprush of, of anti-suburbanism, anti-conventionalism, the beginning of the sexual revolution, the beginning of trying to sort of challenge what the sort of the things of the of the main society were. And you had this sort of active sense of bohemia, the active sense of, you know, that there was a group of people who were creatives, that they were out there, that they were drinkers. It had a lot to do with bars, you know, spent an inordinate amount of my time as a young person in pubs and bars because that's where things happened. The sort of cafe society was a bit, well, I mean, you got that in France, but then you drank in the cafes as well. So alcohol was very much part of it. Drugs hadn't really taken on that sort of scene at that stage. And into that, you slide this idea of the creatives, you know, whether it's the creative writers or the creative painters. And looking back on it now, you realise how very solidly it actually reinforced many of the sort of gender differences that were very much traditionally part of Western civilization. So women could be part of it if they stuck into the sort of female roles. And I started going back and starting to look through that. I thought, this is just my prejudices. I mean, you know, I read, one of the people I read at that stage was Simone de Beauvoir and the Second Sex, which was her attempt to explain, I think, some of how women, in a sense, were not born what they were, they were made. And the whole issue about society, and I'm a sociologist, so that what really interested me was to sort of talk about the society that how society makes those sorts of gendered images. And I started sort of playing around. First of all, I threw into Google, I love Google, uh, the idea of Gully Jimson and, uh, and um, Francis Bacon and found much to my surprise and pleasure actually that I wasn't the only one that had made that connection, that it sort of came up quite often. And if you look at it, the, you know, the idea that Bacon is very much sold as a package. Yes, the paintings, you go down there, and I must confess, I find them quite scary. I'm not sure I'd like them. But they are very impressive. But is Bacon as impressive as this all actually manifests? Or how much of what Bacon is, is this ideal of the artist? If Bacon had been a boring man or a woman and painted identical paintings, would we be sitting here today? Would the exhibition happen? Or is he a manifestation of that particular view of the creative enterprise and of the genius that enshrines within it a set of characteristics which are fairly clearly masculine. And the reason I become interested in that is that whole idea that worries, you know, of, of looking at what do we mean by the arts, and it comes up in almost in a whole lot of other areas of the arts. You get it in writing to the point where people have set up the stellar as an alternative to the Miles Franklin Prize, which is the, the prize that there's a group of women in Melbourne that have set it up for women writers, because if you look at the number of people that get nominated for, prize, for the literary prizes, they tend to be a minority of women. 
you get it in uh, in plays and play uh, playwrights and uh, play and directors because I went to a session. I don't know whether anybody else here remembers it at the Belvoir Theatre a few years ago, where there was an outburst because they realised that women were left out of almost all the major plans, either as directors or playwrights. And there was a big fuss about it. And I can remember Jim Sharman standing up saying, oh, but we did women a few years ago, and then we did refugees, and then we did Aborigines. And he thought, I don't think you get it. <laughs> and there's still that sense that women are a category and not the real category. The real category is sort of defined by that masculinized version of things. You get it in film. I remember a study that I was involved in in the 1990s, which showed which followed up some earlier film stuff where women had been not very frequent in some of the technical areas but had been scattered across a whole lot of other things, particularly directors' positions and so on. By the time we measured it in the 90s, and I haven't seen the more recent stuff, women had turned up massively in the role of producers, were far less likely to turn up as directors and turned up as script editors rather than script writers. So there we are, back into the supportive roles not the main produ creative roles. And I got into trouble because I wrote in the report that you know produ film production is a bit like housekeeping. And if you think about it, it is. You make sure the food's there, the costumes are there, the people are there, but you don't actually contribute so much to the, the, the uh, fashionable, uh, you know, the uh, creative part of it. So it really started me thinking because I've got a friend called Elvis Richardson who runs, if you're interested, a website called Countesses. I don't know how many people have actually seen it. And she actually goes through and looks at the number of women that are shown in various exhibits, including the Caldor one downstairs, where I think it's a pathetic number of something like three women and seven collaborations against something like 81 males or something of that sort as part of it. All right, some people say the trouble is women just aren't good enough, but how do we find good enough? Because every time you end up with these arguments, you get people, mainly blokes, saying, of course, the problem is that we don't judge people on a gender basis, we judge them on merit. And you think, all right, either women are not creative or maybe the concept we have of merit is in itself gendered. And if you think back, that's what interested me about doing the thing tonight and about thinking about the, the, the Bacon exhibition. If we use this as an example... I think we can actually say that embedded quite deeply into Western civilization is the idea that masculinity and creativity is gendered. That they're tied together in such a way that women are not expected to do things in the same way as men are, to the point where even in an area where you have a very large number of women in curatorial positions, or in production positions, or in management positions, and all sometimes in powerful positions, they still go along with the dominant view, which is serious creativity just doesn't go with being feminine. And when you look at what happens and where the women are allowed to do things, you find that, again, they tend to be in the decorative stuff, they tend to be seen to do the nice things. But if you had a woman who behaved in the way that uh, that Francis Bacon made, I suspect he probably wouldn't have got very far. I mean, the few women that hung around his circle didn't get very far. And most of them didn't have children, I noticed, or have any of those sort of domestic things. They tried to live in that sort of thing. So a woman who tries to behave like a male genius is likely to be regarded as a bit tacky. But, you know, a male who behaves like a female genius, well, you know what we think about that. And it's not sexuality because, in a sense, it's, uh, you know, if you look at Bacon, that wasn't the sorts of issues. So we somehow either seem to be hung on to the idea that genius gets expressed in a way which is distinctly masculinized because it's got to be this supported, individualistic, you know, explosive process of creativity. So looking at the Bacon stuff and reading about Bacon, you realize that it's very much part of, of the discussions of Bacon. Why do we always talk about his lifestyle? Somebody says, oh, well, he paints it. But lots of people paint their lifestyles, but we don't necessarily embed them quite as much within the conversation. And I think Bacon is a very satisfying person to run a, a huge exhibition on. And it's a very impressive exhibition. I think it looks fantastic. And I think some of the, you know, the way it's being handled is absolutely fantastic. 
But it's partly fantastic because Bacon is not just a painter. Bacon is this iconic archetypal figure that satisfies our sense of what an artist should be and what he can be. He's a problem. You know, he has relationships, he's into violence, he's into all of these things, and wow, look at the paintings. But would we look at the paintings quite the same way if that whole machismo view of who Bacon is and how he reacts is, would actually work? So, uh, and I just want to go back briefly because one of the things I've got within my own family, my father at one stage married a, a pianist called Hepzibah Menuhin. Some of you might remember the Menuhin family. And Hepzibah was the younger sister of Yehudi Menuhin and she had an even younger sister called Yalta. And I made a program on the ABC about her after she died in 1980. And one of the things I found was a letter of hers which basically said, I am never comfortable being a soloist, not even playing in a, you know, in a, on a concerto. I'm much more comfortable being an accompanist or playing in a small group. And I thought, what is that? Well, it's very simple. Yehudi was the genius, Hepzibah was the accompanist, and Yalta was a bit, you know, won over and they didn't really quite know what to do with her, even though Hepzibah once said she was probably the most talented of them all. And you can see within that one family the sets of assumptions that actually created differentiation amongst musicians. So I'm offering this, and I'm just going to stop at this stage, I think we've got a couple of minutes if any people think, to say, I think one of the reasons that in almost every area of the arts, the visual, the written, the, you know, the filmic, the various other things, we still have a highly gendered a set of assumptions deciding what is merit, that it's about time we broadened it out. My ambition as a feminist is not to turn us all into surrogate men, but to change the criteria by which we judge things. So those things which are seen as feminized and seen as the purview of women become as important and as creative and as exciting as those things done by men. Thank you.